Dr. Van Watson, there's been increasing evidence over the last few years surrounding the world of fatty liver and visceral fat deposition and what really might be the driving cause behind it, which is really interesting. And it's not trans fats, it's not sugar, which are all negative players for sure. But fatty liver disease, uh, as the name implies, involves excessive fat in the liver. And in many cases, and you're not surprisingly, right, that people who have more fat in their body, so uh, people who are obese, uh, have a higher risk of having fatty liver disease. The problem is, is that the assumption was that this was no big deal in the early days, right? It's like, well, you have fat in your body, you have visceral fat, you have fat in your liver, no big deal. The belief now is, you know, it's driven by a dysfunctional metabolism, which then drives liver disease, this fatty liver disease and the downstream outcomes. Even more recently, we're coming to realize there's a growing group of people who are making a good argument that this all actually starts at the liver. And this doesn't have to be tied to obesity, that there are an increasing number of people who are thin, who are developing fatty liver disease. And in fact, it's these thin people with fatty liver disease that have the most severe and aggressive forms of fatty liver disease, that then it's once the liver gets impacted, it then has the downstream effects of impairing you know, our cholesterol, our glucose, and our insulin. Uh, a big clue was that we haven't always had it. So fatty liver disease is relatively new disease when it's not tied to alcohol, right? So alcoholic, liver disease, well-known presentation of having excess fat in the liver that progresses with inflammation, fibrosis, cirrhosis, cirrhotic liver. Um, but now it's basically that same presentation absent the alcohol. And that, you know, the first cases were uh, published and identified by the Mayo Clinic back in 1980. So this is relatively recent. And then the most shocking part is the increase in fatty liver disease cases have gone from those first 10 or 20 cases by Mayo Clinic to now one in three people globally. Every two years, there's a paper published on the global prevalence of fatty liver disease. In a very short time period, it went from 25% to 33%. And now the latest study showed 38% of people globally are sitting on fatty liver disease. So this is a shocking rise in a disease that didn't exist. So it's a big clue, right, to say like, okay, something changed, something new happened that introduced this disease to the world. And that's where the hypotheses of, is it ultra processed foods? Is it increased sugar that we've had in our diets? And that's where the dolphins provided really interesting insight in which when we were working with Navy dolphins, we were seeing them develop fatty liver disease in almost the same time period as we were seeing it in humans. That's identical under the microscope. And clearly with dolphins, wasn't sugar, it's not ultra processed foods. Um, and that's where, you know, over a 10 year period, we were able to understand it was deficiencies in C15 that was driving this particular phenotype of fatty liver disease and all the downstream uh, implications. What we have found, and again, this is a very clean, what's called the pathophysiology of uh, C15 deficiency syndrome or cellular fragility syndrome. What uh, we've been able to show and others now is that as our C15 levels go down in our cell membranes, the red blood cells become more fragile and we have cells within our liver called Kupfer cells. And their whole job is to engulf, not their whole job, but one of their big jobs is to engulf weak red blood cells, take them out of our system and be able to recycle the iron and put it back in our body. What happens when you have lots of red blood cells that are fragile means that those Kupfer cells are now working overtime and they're engulfing lots of red blood cells. And that is resulting in the corpses that are left behind, which is lots of iron, AKA iron overload in the liver. And then that causes what's called dysmetabolic iron overload syndrome or DIOS, which has now been recognized in humans and is on the rise. So it's really this fragile cell membrane resulting in iron overload. And once you have that iron in the liver, this now sets up things like ferroptosis um, that we've talked about, uh, a new form of cell death. 
that then spills over to the rest of the body and impacts a lot of things, including our metabolic health. Uh, there were some genetic studies done to look first at C15 levels and genetics, and they showed that remarkably, genes don't have a big influence on C15 levels, That which makes sense with C15 being an essential fatty acid. Yeah. So as an essential fatty acid, mammals have evolved to use C15. And so therefore, the ones that weren't able to use C15 have kind of you know, died out. So C15 is um, not driven uh, as much, is not driven by major genetic changes. So we can able to take that out, which is unusual because almost everything else, right, is driven by genetics. So the next thing, um, you know, to be able to look at is what are the influences of um, diet? And we know that this whole history of taking out our primary source of C15, right, goes back to 1977 with a congressional recommendation saying that we need to avoid all saturated fatty acids, especially butter and whole fat milk. And that was geared mainly toward adults and kids, but really adults and older kids. It wasn't until there were really two phases. It wasn't until the 1990s when pediatricians then uh, you know, developed these recommendations to tell um, parents to say, hey, as soon as your kiddo turns two years old, you need to take them off of whole fat milk and move them to 2% or 1% or non-fat milk. And the recommendations doubled down even more, I think it was in 1995, that said if an infant is susceptible to obesity and fatty liver disease and type 2 diabetes, then they actually should not get whole fat cow's milk ever, like in throughout their childhood. So we've seen the stepwise way where you look at people at who were born during this time, during the 1990s, they're now in their 30s. And this is the group that you're seeing an increased risks of coronary heart disease, of certain types of cancer, of fatty liver disease.